platform created to entertain, educate, and evolve the modern day deer hunter. Hey, what's up guys, girls, people, fellow Americans, fellow freedom fighters. Welcome into this week's edition of the Deer Hunter Podcast. This was a special episode. Uh, This is a special episode. I would greatly appreciate if anybody that enjoys today's conversation would would share it in whatever capacity that they can. Um, I had the opportunity to sit down this morning and was joined by Tim Kennedy. Um, You may or may not know Tim. Uh, I assume that you will probably want to after you listen to this. He's an outstanding uh, motivational individual that I uh, I found uh, through social media and Joe Rogan's podcast. And man, <laughs> he was a super cool guy to talk talk about. We we didn't really get an opportunity to talk too much hunting specifically on this. We did agree that it would be uh, in the future. We'd do another episode and just talk about hunting. But uh, I wanted to have a conversation with Tim today about everything that's going on here in the country, here on social media, are people losing their rights, um, you know, what is this country basically built on, like, can we, are we, are we moving forward or are we moving backwards as a country? And Tim had brought some stuff up on Joe Rogan's podcast that was pretty alarming to me. And I haven't been able to get it out of my head. It's something that we talk about here on this conversation, but it's, you know, being able to find common ground, being able to have reasonable discussions and meet wherever we have to meet along that path to, you know, move in a forward direction. That really should be the only option if we, you know, if we aspire to move forward, right? So, you know, I've been thinking about that a lot lately lately about accountability and leadership and how you watch. I'm going to say I am, I'm pretty impressed with our direct community here. You guys, uh, my family and friends included, obviously really handling this whole thing. Well, professionally, uh, I see the conversations online. I don't see any fighting on a deer hunter podcast, Facebook group. No, not even one single argument, uh, which is a, a testament to the group of individuals that follow this show. Um, at the heart of that is our Patreon guys. Uh, you guys fund this operation in 2020. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily know that I'm proud to say it won't always ever stay this way, but we, we didn't take a single sponsorship dollar here in 2020. The only thing that funds and operates the show is our, the, the group of individuals that, uh, find they enjoy this enough to go to our Patreon and support us. And, and for that, I am extremely grateful and I will continue to pursue individuals like Tim and have conversations like this so that we can all try to help one another out and better ourselves in some form or another community is a huge thing that's been identified. It's definitely lacking here in this country, a sense of community and being able to just scratch things out and get along and maybe have different political opinions, but who cares? We're going to go hunting still together, have a couple beers or just kind of chew each other's asses for it. And, uh, I've seen a lot of grown men acting in a way that I never thought I would. I'm just, I kind of been shocked here over the past couple weeks on, you know, specifically on social media. It's, it's just been alarming and I feel that uh, we can all do our part to do better and learn from this. And that is why I had Tim on today. Um, It's a great conversation. Do me a huge favor in any capacity that you can. uh, Please share it with your friends or family or anybody else that thinks they might benefit from uh, what we're discussing here today. 
um, man, I, I was just humbled to, to have a conversation with a guy like Tim. It, it really is. He's uh, an outstanding dude. I can't say enough about him. Uh, I will say we didn't, like I said, we didn't get into any deer hunting, um, but we decided we'd do this again and we would, we'd talk about some hunting and I'll, I'll be excited when we can have him back on here. You know, that being said, just to shift in gears here real quick before we get started. I'm not going to drag this thing out. Um, turkey hunting season opened today. I'm going to go out to the family farm with my son. We're going to go monkey around with trail cameras a little bit. He enjoys that. He likes putting the battery trays in and out and the SD cards and setting the cameras and turning them on. That's a big proponent of why I like trail cameras. This is, if nothing else, it's just something fun I can get out and do with, with my son. And in the last couple of years, I've used uh, trail cameras to, you know, pattern where turkeys are coming out of fields in the morning. So if I have limited time, I can have a, you know, a pretty good approach as to where I need to be in the morning that I choose to go hunting. And I just set up my first, I got a, a cellular trail camera, uh, the Exodus render. And I finally had an opportunity to set the applicate. I have to create an account and set an application up on your phone or computer your device and then you essentially pair that with the camera and you can control the camera from the application so you go and set the camera and you can be you know sitting at your desk on your smartphone turning uh doing and you can do everything from software uh, firmware updates to formatting the card changing the camera settings you can view the battery life in real time and uh, you get your pictures in real time. So something that I'm playing with right now, I set it out to do some scouting for turkey hunting. And uh, turkey season is now here. We're going to go out there and set a couple more cameras and see if we can see any tracks in and out of the field and identify where these birds are maybe coming out in the morning to feed first and make a plan to go turkey hunting here in the next couple weeks when the opportunity presents itself. Hopefully there won't be snow on the ground. Spring turkey hunting, right? Spring turkey hunting like not 32 degrees and snow on the ground. So I'm glad it's a long season. It's right around the corner. Uh, huge thank you to everybody for the support uh, for the show. Patreon guys, stand up community that we have uh, following here. And I'll just ask one, one last thing that was on my mind is uh, going forward. Just pay attention to where you're buying what you're buying, like the back, you know, the back, 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 back story of like how it's actually getting sourced and put together, who's getting paid, who's making money, who supports the products. You, you know, for a long time, if you followed the show, there's been a narrative of made in America, shop local, shop small, support the closest people that, you know, name and a face, man, that I want a name and a face. And I want to like that person as an individual. And then I want to utilize their services. And if you don't have to buy something on Amazon and you can shop at a local store and get it, if it's a tiny little inconvenience, just look at it this way. You get to go have a social interaction, hopefully with somebody that you know the name and the face and you like the person. So I hope that there's a lesson in this that uh, we need to keep our, you know, our small economies. That means like our little communities and municipalities that we live in. Man, we got to keep things strong, and we got to be strengthen our communities from from the bottom up. And uh, man, nobody discussed that in as thorough of a manner as Tim Kennedy. So I'm not going to take up any more any more of your time here this morning. We get to this conversation. Huge thank you guys, and we will be back here next week on the Deer Hunter Podcast. See ya. Completely out of whack, but I guess it's Saturday morning, April the 18th. Um, how has this affected you? Uh, you do a lot of traveling, and you've been probably spending a lot more time at home than what you're used to, huh? Yeah, I, uh, I'm on the road about uh, anywhere from seven to eight months out of the year, uh, traveling, teaching, shooting, or speaking, or deploying with the military, and uh, obviously that has been put on hold. Um, so my life at home hasn't changed the way that, you know, I live on land, we have chickens, I have three freezers full of um, successful hunts this last hunting season. So 
you know, I still go to the range. I, I, I work from home already when I'm not on the road. So it's um, not a lot has changed. The only couple of things are I'm not in a plane and uh, I'm not going into a jiu-jitsu gym to, to choke somebody out. <laughs> Have... Uh... <clears throat> do me a quick favor. Do uh, do a brief introduction of uh, yourself and and who you are and uh, what you do because I do imagine there will be a few individuals that uh, might be get hearing this for the first time. Right, well, um, I'm Tim Kennedy, and I am a just promoted master sergeant within the United States Army, and I am have been my entire career within the Green Berets. So I'm a special forces sniper. And I am just moving over to a team sergeant role where uh, instead of being a, an 18 Bravo, which is a weapons sergeant within the Special Forces Regiment, I'll be a team sergeant, so I'll be in charge of the team. And uh, I've been in the military for 16 years, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Africa, South America, War on terror, war on drugs, um, you know, counter poaching, counter piracy, uh, counter human trafficking. I've kind of been doing this long enough to wear a few different hats. And um, during my time in the military, I also fought professionally and fought for a couple of world titles uh, in the UFC and Strike Force. Um, and uh, I own some companies. Uh, security consulting companies and defensive tactics companies and military apparel company and shoe company. Uh, so I'm, I'm kind of like a, a busy bee, but that's that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, you do wear a lot of hats. Uh, I want to break, break them all down individually, but uh, the fighting thing. You know, uh, Facebook has my algorithm, their television thing, for clicking. I cannot click on the old UFC fights if they bring them up, and it – you, it was just like a six-year anniversary of uh, when you fought and beat uh, Michael Binz- Bisbing, huh? Yeah, yeah, just yesterday. Uh, did I read right? Did you have, like, a, a, over 50 professional fights? Yeah, yeah, I, f- I fought quite a bit. Um, so if you go all the way back to kind of the beginning of the UFC, not to date myself, um, the beginning of fighting as we have governing bodies and it's sanctioned by athletic commissions and you have the U S anti-doping association. Um, that, none of that existed back then. It was, Oh, you're going to go to this casino on this Indian reservation and the winner is going to get $2,000. And like, you didn't even know who you're going to fight until almost you're walking out to the cage um, you know, give or take 30 pounds, you're just going to go out and fight. And that was, you know, like I fought in the basement of bars in New Orleans and I fought, you know, on islands and off the coast of Florida, uh, you know, fought south of the border in Mexico. So this was um, the dark days of MMA. Yeah, you say the dark days, but I think also, <clears throat> I think it was... I think they were the glory. I mean, UFC is great now, and uh, it's really well organized. And, yes, the anti-doping stuff is, is super critical. But, boy, man, you came through with some legends of the sport. Yeah. I, I, uh, it's, it's weird. You know, like, I, I, I fought and beaten, I think, a half a dozen world champions and um, guys that were infamous. You know, like, the only guy to knock out Mark Hunt. Um, Melvin Manhoff, you know, I had to fight that beast, and the Robbie Lawlers, who went on to become one of the best wel- welterweight champions, and obviously Michael Bisbing, who's a total douchebag. Um, I got to beat the brakes <laughs> off him, but uh, you know, a lot of high- highs and lows in my fight career. Did you? Uh, when did you? Wh- what got you into fighting? Was it martial arts, or h- how did that evolution even begin? I think uh, just being a second born had a lot to do with it. I have a big brother that's that's a giant, and his friends were all giants. And um, I mean, there were periods of time, you know, maybe when I was like six, seven, eight years old, where I would come inside bloody and bru- bruised, and uh, you know, my dad would be like, 
listen, boys, if Tim comes in here bloody one more time, you guys are going to have to come in and play inside. And um, that definitely lent itself to having a chip on my shoulder and being a little bit tougher than some other ones. Also, I grew up in a protector household where let's just say my mom's working at the church and it's like a, like this, the church school. It's a, like a go out day field trip and somebody blows through the crosswalk as my as my mom is, is leading all of her little ducklings across the crosswalk. That car, it's going to be missing its rearview mirror. It's going to be missing um, probably a portion of its fender. There's going to be dents all the way along. I'm not joking. This literally happened as my mom punched a rearview mirror off the side of a car and kicked it like 18 times as it drove through the crosswalk, denting, denting it, you know, like this little church woman. And then my dad being a police officer and narcotics officer, um, you know, he's a hero in every way you use that word, um, you know, from being at a mall in Southern California and hearing a woman scream and see my dad jump out of a car and go rescue a woman to uh, flying down to the Caribbean to steal a plane full of cocaine from Pablo Escobar. Like, that's my dad. Oh, my God. So, yeah. So at the age of, like, four, I'm in kindergarten. Somebody makes fun of Laura Carey. Like, maybe I had a crush on her. I don't know. I'm four. But, you know, you make fun of Laura that she had a boy haircut and you call her a boy. I'll lead you up to the second play gym and I'm going to punch you in the face. I'm going to push you off of it, and um, which is what I did. So, you know, starting very, very young, having that perspective of we protect the weak and we protect the um, – those that can't protect themselves, because that's what I saw happened in my household. That um, then, when you add kind of, I came from great genetic stock. Um, Olympic athletes in my family, and I have world um, people that are in the Hall of Fame for a myriad of sports, and you know, uncles and a father that still hold NCAA records, uh, like currently. So, and then being that middle-born, smaller than all of my my, my brother's friends um, in making you tough creates like this in, in this petri dish of what is this little thing going to become um, a pretty tough talented mean dude yeah so it sounds like it was never not in your life uh, it was in your life before your life even existed yeah but before I had a choice about what my life was going to look like it was in my life yeah yeah that makes sense now uh, a lot of what I've seen of you that 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 would make sense. Um, did you? I'm imagining you wrestled in high school. I, d I did. I was not a great wrestler. I always split my time between uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and wrestling. And you think that like now those would complement each other. You know, you see like the Ben Askrens or you know like a Jordan Burroughs could come over and be dominant in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Um, then they were very. It might have been my in, my inability to adapt them, but uh, I actually got disqualified in some fights for for positions and holds that I was you're not supposed to do in one or the other, and, um, and you know my and, and splitting like the time that I dedicated to getting good at either one of them individually. Um, so I was like, yes, I wrestled in high school, but I wasn't great. You know, that brings up something that I wanted to ask you about. Um, you talking about wrestling and uh, jiu-jitsu and being a protector. Uh, I have a five-year-old son. I know you have some young kids. Uh, one of my biggest, uh, I guess I'll say, you know, worries or concerns that I think about now is how am I going to deal with uh, when my son is in high school? And I know I'm not going to do well with it if there's uh, people that are, you know, bad kids that are doing bad shit to my kids. I'm going to want my kids to defend themselves. And I got to imagine you got a plan in place for your kids to do the same, huh? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the, uh, I always, I, I use a lot of military ideas. I, I, um, I changed the vernacular so it doesn't so sound so like 
intimidating, but I, I too have a five-year-old son and I've, uh, I have a, I have a teenage, teen, teenage daughter. There was a period of time I found out she's being so, she's being bullied and not fighting back. Uh, like there was a game of pushing her on the ground and keeping her on the ground when she was in middle school. And, um, you know, like I, so with my son who is not going to have the same passivity as my daughter, cause that dude is a, he's a savage. Um, the, uh, like I'm going to be having to pull the reins on him be like under for him. It's going to be understanding you're operating your operational environment, right? Like, um, you know, if there's a kid that's bullying another kid, they're not going to bully my son. Like I'm not going to have any worries about that. But, um, and if they, like they're going to get cracked in the face and, and I will happily deal with that problem. But more so, I know that, you know, like a hornet landed on my six month old daughter, a, a yellow jacket. And my son, my five year old son, not a heartbeat went by, not a moment before he reached out and grabbed that hornet off of my baby, our six month old baby. Like think about a five year old reaching out. He knows he's going to get stung. And he, and he knocked that hornet off of her. Um, one of many examples where I'm like, all right, this is going to be the case. So to my daughter, understand your operational environment, right? I, I'm i sitting there and be like, okay, do I kill this 12-year-old kid? Okay, no, I can't do that. <laughs> um, do I go and kill this kid's parents? No, I also can't do that. So you know, I walk into the principal's office. I was like, hi. Um, I know we've had a lot of interaction. He's like, oh, I know who you are. I'm like, all right, good. So that's going to really fast forward me having to explain how serious what I'm about to say is. If my if anything happens again to my daughter, I'm going to burn the school to the ground. Every single person here is going to be unemployed and you're going to be in jail. For, and you're going to be in jail for the rest of your life and living and your family is going to be destitute because I'm going to sue every single person that had anything to do with this. I'm talking scorched earth here. So I don't care if somebody walks my daughter around during recess, but that child is not going to be bullied one more time. And neither is any other kid in this whole entire school. Yeah, dude, that shit hits a nerve with me. And that that's my concern. Uh, growing up, I had uh, an, a temper and a, an attitude problem without question, man. I, I put my parents through the ringer. I was the black sheep of the family. No one was confrontational. I never seeked out confrontation, but I definitely never walked away from it. And uh, it yeah. got it got me in, uh, you know, my share of problems. But uh, my parents put me into martial arts when I was young, uh, karate, taekwondo. I wrestled, did, uh, you know, jujitsu. And, and that helped me sort a, a lot of that out. But but I, I worry that I'm going to have to deal with my temper when I do get, like you're saying, I know these situations are going to rise. Um, my son already, just given my genetics and my wife genetics, is a smaller body type, so he's going to be he's going to be the smaller guy for his age. But I, I know he'll be, or I foresee him, what I've seen already, being probably more athletic than most kids. But he's to that age right now where I feel like I want to get him wrestling I want to get him in jujitsu, and I guess that's what I was trying to get to. Um, I feel like the grappling stuff is uh, really important for self-defense versus the striking, or is it all important? I think it's all important. Um, so my son at five, uh, we're like dabbling in Taekwondo and having fun. Um, I have boxing stuff at the house and, you know, like showing him how to punch correctly but we definitely, in in our father son playtime, it is it is mostly grappling based. You know, whether we're on the trampoline and it's and it's like try to grab the legs and hold them down, i.e. a double leg. Um, you know, how to grab one leg and try to spin them, i.e. A, a single an outside single. Um, like these are like intentional, deliberate games that we play. Um, you know. We, we, we sumo wrestle. Uh, we like draw a, 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 uh, a circle on the ground with sand and we try to push each, like push each other out of this, the circle. I like, again, Greco wrestling and sumo wrestling. So I, um, I, I had a lot of friends 
by the time they got to, um, I think I started wrestling when I was in middle school, early, yeah, middle school. Um, they were already burnt out in wrestling. Like they, they didn't, they didn't want to do it. And they, they ended up because they left athletics being, you know, bad kids. They, you know, started smoking in high school because like their, their, their dad who had wrestled like projected that onto them. So then they, they didn't want to do it. Um, you know, like my, my son, it's, it's an opposite because I'm not forcing it. It's like, he, these are these games that we're playing and, um, and they're just, it's just playtime. But this playtime is, is of course physical. Um, we, we like love to wrestle on the trampoline. Um, we have wrestling mats that we roll out and, um, and I was like, all right, now go, go try to tackle your mom. And like, he <laughs> thinks that's the funniest, the funniest thing ever. Yeah, so. that's great. Do you, uh, I mean, I know you're doing your damnedest to raise your kids right and, uh, you know, see that they have a better future than what we had and they're going to do their part to keep this country great. You know, you were on, I don't know, God, it seems like it was yesterday, but I guess it's at least a few months back now when you were on with Joe Rogan and you were talking about the military and the recruitment problems that they had, they're, they are currently having. And, uh, do that horrified me what you were, what you were explaining. Yeah. Um, at Corona is another example of it, you know, where the, the people that are dying are, are really the, the outliers of kind of the, the physical health level. And I, I hope that, you know, nobody's not enough people listen to Joe Rogan or care what I say when I say, Hey, we're having a recruiting problem. We don't have enough abled bodied people coming into the military. You know, it's harder to get into the military and get a good job than it is to get into a pretty elite university. Like it's, it, it, it's not easy. And, um, you know, if you have asthma, you're out. If you have bad vision, you're colorblind, you're out. If you, um, you know, I've done drugs or have a criminal record, you're out. None of those things preclude you from going into the, a university. Like, honestly, sometimes it's there, it's even better. Um, and right now, as we're watching you know, tens of thousands of people dying all over the world. Most of those people are obese. Most of those people smoke. And um, you know, those are the same problems that we have in, in special forces recruiting is like the kids are just too fat. Like they're just too soft. They're just too um, sitting sedentary lifestyles of video games and Cheetos. And uh, you know, like the bones are different. Like when, when you and I grew up, you know, we're jumping out of trees and, and the rope swing breaks and we're in the tire swing and we like bounce off the tree and then like end up in the thicket, you know, and, and while that was hilarious and horrifying at the time, um, unbeknownst to us, our bones and body just got stronger, you know, like, we're like, Oh, can you jump out of this tree? Yeah, I can jump out of that tree. And, um, our bones get stronger. The percentage of kids as more kids are in school, which is great, the percentage of kids that are that are playing sports are decreasing. Uh, we have the lowest participation in sports ever, and uh, you know, like whether it's basketball or soccer or football, um, lacrosse, all of those things do things both to the brain and to the body that make that person stronger later in life. And um, you know, type two fast twitch and power muscle fibers to, to bone density. Um, well, kids right now are, are we have the lowest or smallest population of kids that have the things that are required to be a green beret. For example, with that said, my heart gets warmed every time I go and see the next group of, of new soldiers coming in because there are still, thousands upon thousands and tens of thousands of courageous, brave young American women, men and women that are going to volunteer to take the burden of freedom on their own shoulders. And, um, they're scared. No, maybe they're not as strong as, as, as my generation, but my dad's generation probably said the same thing about us. 
you know, um, and then I'm sure my grandpa's generation, who is the greatest generation that fought in World War II and survived the Great Depression, um, I'm pretty positive they said it about my dad. So, um, you know, my, my dad, when he met his mom, my mom was a long haired hippie water polo player. And, uh, you know, that later became an incredible patriot and, and hero. So, I, I think it's all going to shake out and I think it's all going to get worked out, but uh, there's definitely an attack on masculinity and powerful people. And that scares me. I would agree with that. You know, I, when you were talking about that, it, it struck a nerve with me because I, I work in the skilled trades and we're having such a hard time bringing in young men and women that want to do this work. And it, it's, it just blows my mind because the jobs are so good in comparison. So I've done the suit and tie thing and uh, I was in the trades and, and, and did the suit and tie thing. And I came back to the trades and it was the best move I ever made. Like my family would have suffered uh, some pretty heavy losses during this time, particularly if I hadn't made that move. And it just blows me away that uh, this money is here, this opportunity is here. You can provide a service and help people, and it's an unappealing job to some people. And I, I'm wondering, what, and and I, I, you know, it just I used that comparison in my head when when you were talking about the people not wanting to do the military jobs. It just kind of blows my mind. Yeah, it's it's the exact same. It, it's the same problem, right? Um, a little bit of you know, if it's cultural, where you know, you, you have academia that's being like, no, you can't be a plumber or an electrician, you know, like you're going to be blue collar your whole entire life. Um, you know, you're going to be dealing with other people's problems. And and all of that is coming from positions of ignorance because they've never done it. And they don't know how incredible a life that it can provide. Like I know firsthand, like I, uh, I just bought a new house and I had solar installed and we're like real, not, not like, full prepper, but, you know, wiring it so that I can use that solar if, let's say, the power grid goes down, um, and having a, a true electrician come in and, like, explain this to me, I'm like, bro, you're, you're like, you're like Einstein level genius, you know, he's like, no, man, I'm just an electrician, I was like, no, man, like, one, I'm, I'm, I'm paying you a crap ton of money to be able to do this, you know, like, I should have just been an electrician, and two is, like, I'm just dumbfounded at the overall accurate the level of knowledge and expertise that they, they, they have in the field. And, you know, that goes for all of those specialty trades. Um, and I, and I, I believe, you know, like Europe is a really great example of it. You know, specialty trades there are now incredibly respected jobs. You know, like you don't, you don't have to go into medicine and go work for world health and organization and wear a monocle with like a wool jacket to be respected in Europe. Like if you're wearing a jacket and you are a mechanic, you're, you are respected in Germany, you know, like as respected as the doctor from so-and-so. And And, um, I think that the past maybe 15 years, this, this ignorant position coming from academia and, you know, even high school teachers, a little bit of ego, like, no, no, I want my students to go into college and become this or that. Like that is so selfish and so short sighted when in truth, like a lot of those kids be like, no, go to this auto mechanic shop and learn how to use a wrench. You are going to be an amazing engineer. I can see the way that your brain works and I cannot wait to see the newest version of the Corvette that you're going to design. Um, and, uh, I, I, I hope and I, I I think that we are going to make that curve and uh, we'll get better for it. I wonder, so I always try to, no matter what, I always try to look at the pros versus the, well, first of all, I always weigh the pros and cons, and then I always try to look at the pros and support those. And when this whole coronavirus thing hit, I I looked at it as a very unique opportunity in our lifetime. Uh, I'm, I'm 36 years old. Uh, I have, you know, a young child. When I'm deciding 
how I want to dictate or not dictate, but try to help him navigate his future so that he has a secure career. Things like this can happen. And I felt like this was an, uh, an amazing opportunity for people to step back and look and see and say, all right, we kind of see what are, what are these critical jobs, who's working, who's not, who's making good money. Uh, I wonder if this, if other people are able to look at it like this and there is a shift with the tone of military jobs and trade jobs versus people being just burdened with student debt and, and you know, really be, their wealth being dictated by a lot of other individuals versus them dictating their own ability to make money. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I love this analogy, um, you know, where soft times or hard times make hard men and then hard men make good times, good times make soft men and then soft men make hard times. And, uh, you know, that, that cycle you, you see over and over again throughout history, you know, from the Greeks, to the Romans to the samurai, um, you know, the, even here, just in our, in our short span of history since 1776, you have seen that here where you, you, you see like hard men create something great. And then the next group be like, ah, we'll just hang back. And then Washington DC is burning. And then you're like, ah, we'll be hard again. And then it's like, oh, we have to go into the greatest war. And it's like, ah, we're just going to hang back. And then it's like, oh, there's a bunch of fascists in Europe that are gassing Jews. And, uh, over and over again, this, this happens. Um, so I don't know if it's just a necessary cycle or, um, you know, if it, those are just second and third order effects of just how history works. With this scenario specifically that's going on, uh, I see a lot of grown men that I've been, <laughs> you know, it's been disappointing to me to see how many grown men are just spending their time uh, sitting on social media complaining. I look at it as an accountability problem. I, I'm not going to really complain about what anybody else is doing because at the end of the day, these decisions that I have made in the past have put me in the position that I'm in and I don't really or I try my best not to rely on anybody else for anything outside my small social circle my family and myself and uh, it, it's been disappointing I, I don't feel like what we're going through right now is that much of a hardship is it or is it just the fact that we haven't really in you know I guess since 9-11 we really haven't faced any big hardships in this country no, this is um, this is not. Well, for, for some, we, we have created because of panic hardship for a lot of families. Like there's there's people that are looking at their rent and their mortgage, and they have no idea one how they're going to pay it, or two if they were not evicted, how they'll ever ever be able to catch back up because of you know that they have been out of work for now six weeks. But in in, in real talk. Corona is not, and this pandemic is not horrific. It's not, thank God, because um, we were not prepared for it. Had it been a bad one, this could have been really, really bad, but it wasn't. Thank you. And um, and I, I agree, watching these people like freak out and live in fear and make fear-based decisions and, you know, like the, the fact that there was a, a hashtag quarantine and chill that was the number one trending thing in the United States affects me to no end. Like I cannot, I couldn't tell you, I'm not bragging. I guess I am in, in the past three weeks with me not traveling, I have, I've like repaired. I, I don't even know how many projects I have done at my house. And I don't know how many things I have done with my family in the past three weeks from we set up a camp inside of my son's pirate ship that we put up. Um, not just the camp, but also the pirate ship. You know, like um, brought in, a, bought and assembled a trampoline, fixed a pergola, got the pool ready for summer, um, repainted and restained every single piece of wood on the whole entire exterior of my house. Um, you know, fixed the electrical, installed that, or finished the solar, installed the battery system. Um, expanded the chicken coop, expanded the garden. You're like, like, I have no idea 
all the things that we've done. And then I, I look at other men of the same age and they're like, oh man, I just played Warzone and I just got like a, whatever, three kills. And I was like, what is wrong with you? What is wrong? What happened that this is what you're doing now? One that you accepted. Like I, I haven't had, like I'm an entrepreneur and my, my business is traveling and my business is going and training people. I can't do that. And even with that being the case, like I haven't been hurt economically because I was able to pivot in other ways and provide services in other ways that I can get paid for. Um, and I get it. Like if you're a barber and they say all barber shops are closed down, that, that makes it tough for you. I also know that yesterday I got a great haircut and I paid my dude in cash, you know, and um, <laughs> he, hopped his, he hopped in the car, grabbed his clippers and his scissors. And now my son also looks like a proper gentleman with a good haircut. You know, so like, did we take precautions? Were we irresponsible? Yes, we took precautions and no, we weren't irresponsible. You know, like y- y- we have to be reasonable about these things. And uh, and I think anytime that you're making a decision based off of fear, you're not being reasonable. I completely agree with that. I, I The irony of the individuals that are just constantly complaining, there there's workarounds. Uh, you just have to be, I feel, you know, moderately intelligent about it and you have to be very responsible given the nature of what i do we provide service uh plumbing service at hospitals so i've been i've been swamped and you know i'm going into patient rooms covid positive i'm having to go into protocol meetings with these nurses you know be be right there with with everyone that's infected and then i have to do my part to make sure that when i go to the gas pump uh, I'm thinking about who's coming there behind me even, you know, a couple hours later and could potentially be affected. So, uh, you know, the being responsible thing is is the biggest thing, and I guess just owning it. And I can't get pat. I just, I've really, you know, you said this also on Rogan. Uh, I just re-listened to this episode recently, but you said, I'm, I'm having a very difficult time communicating. And and I, I heard that, man, because... I've been trying to maybe talk some people off the ledge and just say, hey, you know, there is some real stuff going on. I've been in the hospitals. It's a, it's kind of a crazy scene. If I was just stuck at home sitting on the couch reading a news feed, I don't know that I'd believe any of what's going on. And I get that, man. It is a hard time to trust anything that you're reading online. But I've, I've tried to be some semblance of a voice of reason and just say the truth does lie somewhere in the middle. There is a problem. It might be being blown out of proportion. And I've just been just hammered i mean criticized told to shut up uh and it's like man i i don't know what to do here yeah we're i mean we're living in this you know there's a name for that that's the outrage culture where if you're not doing the thing that the mob and i use the word the mob going dating back to the romans where the mob didn't approve of it you know you're, you're going to be murdered um, and in our case, it's not literal murder where they're, you know, they're stabbing you in your sleep or they're putting venom poison in your drink. But um, like there is complete mob rule right now, especially on social media, where if you don't subscribe to this, this greater idea that's that's created by the collective, then the collective has the right or they think that they have the moral high ground to attack you. Um, and they're they're wrong like any form of outrage culture any kind of mob result any form of like collective um negative response to an individual is is wrong because everything is about individual responsibility like, i believe that that the strength of america has always resided all the way down to the smallest individual being the single family and and if you know, if you go back to kind of our beginning, it was a single family carving their existence out of the woods, you know, fighting animals, and you know, in some instances, the Native Americans, and and then the French, and then the British, and then finally being like, all right, this is who we are, but we're going to create this document, i.e., the Bill of Rights, that is going to enumerate the power of the individual because we recognize 
that the power of the individual is the thing that is the backbone of, of who we are and what we do. So this outrage culture tries and attacks that. They try to, um, and I, I have been a recipient, a recipient of this outrage culture countless times. Um, and if I were gonna just say anything to you, it was, it was like, stay the course. Just stay the course. Um, maybe figure out new ways to, you know, since after that, that Joe Rogan podcast, Joe and I kind of talked off the side and, you know, he said, no, you, you have to keep saying what you're saying. People have to hear what you're trying to tell them. Um, and if I was just going to say anything, it's like figure out new ways to say it. You know, um, that might be TikTok. You know, that might be, you know, a clever meme. That might be a funny cartoon. Um, all saying the same thing, just through different mediums. And, um, and as I'm trying to encourage people not to make decisions, especially about their freedoms, based out of fear, like that sounds kind of like an asshole thing to say. One, it's because I'm saying that they're giving away something that they're going to want later. Two is I'm telling them that they're scared. And those are two things that two, that a human doesn't really like to hear. So you have to be sometimes a little bit more clever about you know, applying, you, you used a great, a great word, which was reason. You have to be able to reason with them and sometimes speak in their own language. And you can get hammered for that, too. I was talking with Lance Armstrong on his podcast, and I used the word gun control in relation to gun laws because I was speaking. I was trying to speak in his language um, and trying to bring Lance and his audience over to the side of freedom. But then the conservative side heard me use the word gun laws and how that that could be a solution to gun violence and they then thought that I was for gun control but they weren't smart enough to realize that I was using his language to try and change the the verbiage of the vernacular of the conversation to speak to him in a way that he understood and was comfortable so that I could put our thoughts and our, our ideals into this conversation and plant seeds of freedom um it's a, you know, conversation. It's a hard, it's a hard thing, especially for a hairy handed over. I, I hear you with that because I, I, I subscribe to that, uh, you know, within uh, a, a, a narrower window of what I do here with trying to promote hunting. I, I use that, um, you know, I, I can go to a, a vegan restaurant and, and really have a peaceful conversation with a lot of individuals and I don't subscribe to that attack method of getting back at them or, you know, that I'd rather get, I'd rather get, uh, even than get ahead. I rather get ahead and meeting in the middle is, is how we move ahead. You have someone far to the left and far to the right and you sit at a campfire and you have a couple beers and you scratch something out and maybe each move a percentage in, in the right direction towards the middle. And that's where you, that's how you move forward. But, you know, specifically back to the social media thing, that's kind of how I felt about it. And my wife got on me last week and she said, you know, you've been on Facebook a lot and arguing with people. And I, I yeah, you're, you're really right. You know, I don't know. Am I, am I being immature? Is this an ill use of my time? But, I, you know, my statement back to her was, well, some things are worth arguing about. And I had to step back and look, am I part of the problem? here or am i doing any good i'm mean, i'm trying i'm trying but man are people making it hard yeah and you know social media is i think being identified and and from my perspective notoriously an ineffective medium to have a conversation or to have an argument yes uh, very rarely is 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 any argument won but rather points are scored and those points are just ego checks in exclusively the realm of social media. You know, like you put your phone down and you're like, yeah, got that guy. Look at this argument. You know, nobody, nobody cares. <laughs> nobody cares. And the person that you just got one on, you know, like oh, I won that argument. Like, no, no, he just blocked you or muted you. You know, like you absolutely did not win him over. Um, you, you just lost somebody else that you're going to be able to talk to. Yeah. Yeah. The scoring the point thing. That's a, that is a great analogy versus trying to actually have a conversation. You know, uh, 
moving above and beyond that, there there is a kind of a serious – there's some underlining agendas that are going – well, there's two big problems that I I have – I feel that I've witnessed here over the course of the last month. One is the media in this country, the the traditional media channels, and have spent so many years crying wolf that no one knows what or who to trust anymore. And the other thing is that this um, being an election year, there is a narrative behind what's going on now that is going to be used this fall uh yeah yeah i I don't think but it's good and bad um it's good especially i I think this pandemic really showed exposed um the, the the way that the media plays the hand that they're dealt and they cheat they lie. Um, they, they don't tell the truth. They just want you to respond. They want a visceral response because a visceral response is great ratings. Great ratings is great money and great money is more power to them. And, um, and I, I think, you know, if, when you look at um, people that have responded to Corona and how they responded if people that have never bought a gun before in their entire life went out and bought a gun, uh, a bunch of people that had never thought about hunting for the first time was like, how am I going to feed my family if there's no food in the grocery store? Um, and I, 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 I have been approached by countless, uh, I'll, I'll call them friends, but they, you know, like very progressive, very left and completely ideologically different than me. And um, all of them with the same kind of positions of, okay, what do I do? Um, what is going to happen? I am scared and I don't know what to do. And um, it, even if I did know what to do, I wouldn't know how to do it. You know, like hunting, for example. Like even if, even if I was like, okay, hunting is a solution. Um, like where do they start? Well, they don't own a gun. No, no you can't. <laughs> Sorry, that 1022 that you're going to go in and buy, that's not going to do you any good unless you're going to eat rabbit. Um, you know, the, uh, you know, that like grotesque blind that you think you're going to put on the back one acre of your property, um, is also not going to yield you any food. Um, you know, like, but being caring and compassionate and loving in, in an attempt to try and secure them on this side of, of rational, of reasonable, uh, and, but everybody, I think regardless there are the outliers and those are just people that I don't know if we'll ever, ever be able to convince them to, of what logic looks like. Um, you know, but that's like, that's like a one or 2% while they're the loudest one or 2% out there. The other 98% is looking at the media being like, they lied to us. They shut down the economy. They have done trillions of dollars of damage to the American people no, I cannot live off of $1,200 given to me by President Trump. Um, and I'm mad. You know, like the governor of Michigan saying you can't buy seeds and you can't buy paint. paint. Um, California saying, hey, we are now prohibiting all sales of guns because they're not essential. Nevada trying to classify all semi-automatic weapons as machine guns so that any semi-automatic weapon would be illegal to own within that state all of those things while they thought that politicians were being clever in this moment of fear and panic people saw that Um, they didn't see it through mainstream media because that was being hidden but everyone else is like why didn't i see this oh it's because i've been lied i've been I've, i've been lied to and i'm being lied to and i'm going to respond appropriately come 2020 and i'm going to vote so that the person that's representing his constituents, i.e. me, would do the right thing by me in moments like this. Real leader, real leadership. Leadership. God, I'm glad you brought that up. You know, from the beginning of our conversation and talking about kids that, you know, are struggling to come up, do we have a, from top to bottom, do we have a leadership problem in yes. this country? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, it depends. If you look at, CEOs of Disney and Apple and 
um, Google as leaders, then yeah, we got a problem. If you look at celebrities in Hollywood that are that are telling us how we're supposed to live in quarantine from their five million dollar house in Laguna, you know, where there's 15 bedrooms and uh, three different swimming pools, and be like, no, 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 just stay at home. It's not that bad. No, kiss my ass. Go back to your Laguna beach house and uh, let me figure out how I'm going to feed my family and pay my rent. Yeah, we have a leadership problem. If you're going to look to politicians who are literally leeches living off of the American people, then yes, we have a leadership problem. Hmm. But if you look elsewhere, if you look to the Jocko Willings, if you look to the Joe Rogans, if you look into the Nick Palmashanos and the Evan Hafers, if you look to the Dakota Myers, there are leaders out there um, that are brave, that are courageous, that are doing the right thing. And, um, and giving me faith in the future. We even, we empower, uh, I mean, we, the people, and you brought up uh, and you mentioned it, and I've heard this referenced a lot of times, the Trump check. And I, I'm, uh, I won't say that that's my check. Uh, Trump, uh, those politicians, they don't make us money. We give, we, we give them money and we expect services in return and i hold myself account accountable at a high level and i expect you to do the same and that is a pretty small return on what i feel is the damage that has been done by you potentially not being as accountable as i would hold myself yeah um yeah the one i'm I'm not getting a check two is um that I'm going to tell a horrible story. It's a true story, a story of Stalin. And um, there, there was a time where he had all his generals and his kind of his executives of the cabinet in a room, and he took a chicken and he plucked the chicken in front of everybody. He tore feathers out of this live chicken, and the chicken was I'm mean, just screaming in agonizing pain, and these guys are this this room is just horrified as this. This murderer, this man that goes on to murder you know, tens of millions of people, is plucking a live chicken, sets the chicken down, you know, with like mangled feathers hanging off of it as it's bleeding on the ground, and then takes out a few kernels, morsels of bread, and he drops it on the ground, and the chicken starts following him. And he said, this, this is what people will do when you just give them a little bit of sustainment, not enough that they need to survive, but just enough so that they'll follow you. And um, that, that I have seen that used by the Al Qaeda in Iraq, and I've seen it used by the Taliban in Afghanistan. I've seen it used in Venezuela um, to the poor people there, and I've seen it used by the Boko Haram in Africa. And um, while I'm not drawing parallels to our government and those horrible people and places. I am drawing parallels to the idea of giving people just, even though they've torn everything from you, like you are going to die in agonizing pain, but if they give you just a little bit, you'll be happy. Um, don't be that chicken, right? Don't, don't follow the morsels. Um, and also, don't be the general standing there and letting it happen in front of you. What? You know, I would, don't be those guys. Yeah, that that is that is a really good. <laughs> that's a harsh but but good analogy. You know, what do people need to be learning from this? And pay? you said it earlier. Thank God this wasn't something serious because we were not prepared. And that was my initial reaction to this: is like, this isn't that bad, and I feel like we're handling it very poorly um we need to be paying attention to this and be reactive to make sure something because if this was bad this is uh, alarming yeah um you know if this had the mortality rate of another virus let's say aids for example had you contracted this obviously the the ability to transmit hiv is much more difficult than corona um but you know, you know, in the '80s, we're, we're talking a mortality of, of 90 to 190 to 99 percent. Um, you know, where 
comparatively Corona, we're at like 2.3%. And that 2.3 are people with underlying complicating conditions. Um, let's say something that's easily transmittable as Corona with a mortality of HIV, like this is freaking scary. And that is a possibility, especially when you're looking at, you know, when you look at what happened in Wuhan, where you have virology labs 300 feet from wet markets and how like it is really looking like they accidentally spread a coronavirus inadvertently or ignorantly or through an aptitude to their own population. And it, you know that there's worse things in there than Corona. Yeah. You know, like, thank God that's the one that got out. And uh, so to answer your question, what should we do? I, I hope with eyes wide open, we as, uh, as a people, um, I'm not going to tell Italy what to do. Obviously, obviously they weren't prepared. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to tell Australia what to do with their ignorant run on toilet paper. Um, I am going to say that Americans need to get their shit. Uh, you, you as an individual have to like, there's, yeah, it's cool to like do the, I'm going to share my car with three other families. I only need it on Monday, Wednesdays and Fridays, or, um, we have to come together where we can, like, I have, I have hunted meat. I do not have enough artichokes and onions at my house. Um, you know, I have enough chickens and, and, and elk meat to last me a year, but I, I would like some vegetables and I would like some fruits and my two fruit trees are not going to yield enough for me to do the things that I need. Um, so like come together as a community of, okay, what, what do you have that, that I feel comfortable exchanging these services and goods for? Um, two is identifying how weak we are. You know, we, we, this panic came from mortality. Mortality was from people not being healthy. Almost all of the people that died from Corona were unhealthy people. They were smokers, they were vapors, they were marijuana smokers, they were obese, they were diabetic. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking into the 90, 90 plus percentile of all total deaths were unhealthy people. And because of those unhealthy people, we shut down the economy. For every single, every single percentage point of unemployment that is increased, you increase drug use, suicide, by 12% for every single point. We went from 3% unemployment to 15% unemployment in one month. Like the, 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 the numbers of what the projections of the second and third order effects, this isn't like lives versus economy. This is lives versus lives. And I, I think we as a people individually need to be healthier. We need to work harder. We need to have jobs that actually contribute, i.e. trade jobs, plumbers, electricians, landscapers, pool people, uh, mechanics. Like, it became super clear, no, we do not need that, um, that banker or lawyer that thought he was super hot shit two months ago and then he's calling me on the phone being like hey man am i gonna not have food in a month from now like how am i gonna survive um like in the new norm moving forward i don't think we're ever gonna go back to our old normal we're gonna go into a new normal i i i i hope that we will be our eyes will be open to overall healthiness overall work level and then the appreciation of lots of different types of jobs yeah, and may I add to that, to preparation and a mindset of, wow, things are awesome right now. But on the backside of that, real, the realization that that will not always be the case. There will be dark yeah. days, and you better use your sunny days to prepare in some capacity for the dark days. Yeah, amen. Tim, I'm going to be respectful of your time. Uh, we could talk for another couple hours. I, I will say I definitely want to have you back on. We didn't even get to talk anything about hunting, which, you know, I, I felt like this conversation was important to have. 
there's a lot of individuals right now, you know, trying to sort through the bullshit and figure out how they better their families, better themselves, uh, you know, in these times and going forward. So I, I really wanted to, uh, you know, utilize your experience and your broad overview of, tra you know, traveling around the world, being in the military. You've kind of made a, not kind of, you've definitely made a career out of going into harsh environments. And uh, I know the mindset nowadays for a lot of people is they want to avoid all harsh environments as much as possible. And they didn't like that we just got put into one. Uh, I think there's a lot of power in just being accountable and having the mindset of, like you said about the guys sitting around playing video games, having the mindset of how do I come out of this stronger and better than I went into it. Yeah, the uh, rush to ready, man. Um, rush to ready is like this. This I love the word preparedness that you used. Um, I, I I know everybody is going to be more prepared for the next one, but you won't be prepared enough. Like you have to train, you have to find real truth sayers and you have to find real experts. Um, so I really appreciate it. Next time we can absolutely talk about hunting. It's one of my favorite things to do. I'm excited about all the new hunters that are going to be hopefully coming in this new hunting season. So uh, before October rolls around, um, if you're kind of like new to hunting, um, you know, find, find some real experts and go have a cup of coffee with them. And uh, they might talk a little bit funny. You know, they, they might, as, as you have always sought out being comfortable on your couch playing video games, some of these men and women have always sought out hardship. And those people are extraordinary in times of hardship. So, uh, you know, like, well, welcome to the fray, and, and thanks for having me. Hey, the uh, real quick sheepdog response. Uh, plug that website and what that is uh, for people that want to get informed about it. Because I've been on there. Uh, you kind of, on a social media post, tipped me off to SDR Consulting. And I've, I've read through that extensively and used that to inform myself about the, the COVID-19 thing. The, the sheepdog response uh, looks like a lot of people could greatly benefit from that training, huh? Yeah. So we... I own a preparedness company. Like we go and teach people how to fight and how to shoot and how to, you know, do home security. It's a, it's a licensed security, uh, security consulting company. Uh, we also have the people on staff with that company are, um, target analysts from the military, Intel analysts, uh, you know, special forces, Sergeant majors and colonels, um, from West point and from the Naval Academy. Uh, so the, a, a true collective of some of the most brilliant minds in preparedness all under one spot. And, um, we created a living document that was all from primary source information about what COVID really is, how it's going to affect us. And we have been pretty much perfectly accurate in all the things that we projected and told people what to do and what to prepare for. Um, you know, we were saying get gloves and masks a month ago because we knew that the government was going to tell us to do it. Um, you know, we've, we've said that the, the economy was going to shut down and this is going to be damaging, even though it doesn't need to be shut down. This is what's going to happen. And that's what happened. Um, but more importantly, once all of the shenanigans is over, it's a place that you can go to get trained. So we have online, uh, virtual stuff that you can watch right now for totally free. Dry fire drill drops a day, how you can take your gun at home and practice to get better. But we also, um, you can come in person training and train with some of the best professionals that have lived in austere environments and have fought wars in austere environments on the planet under one roof. And that's uh, sheepdogresponse.com. Tim, I'll, I'll tag that in the show notes. And uh, I'll tag also Ranger Up, that's a clothing company, uh, apparel company that you're part of, correct? Yes, sir. Ranger Up. Tim. I, uh, I thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to uh, talking uh, again here in the future. I wish you and your family well. Uh, thank you. Thank you for all you do. Thank you for your service. Um, I hope and uh, I pray that uh, people take away a positive mindset from this and realize that uh, people are capable of a lot more than what they think. And you and uh, the people you associate are proof of that continue what you are doing it is very inspirational and uh i wish you well my friend awesome thank you man hope the wind's always in your face when you're hunting ah, Good luck. love it thank you tim yeah
Bye.